uh, all using uh, VIPs, an image processing system I've been involved with for a, a long time. So I'll be talking uh, briefly a bit of... Oh, is it not loud enough? Yeah. I, think, I think my ears are in the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> is, that, is that your best? Is that okay? Oh, really? Oh, is that, is, does that work better? Yes. How's that? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> right. Um, uh, I've lost my thread now. Uh, I'll, I'll just go on to the next slide. Right. So, so um, VIPS is a, uh, uh, a, a scientific image processing library. Um, and uh, here are the main kind of headline headline features. So it's uh, 2D, color, it's free. Uh, it's based on G-objects, so it fits into the whole GNOME framework. Um, it's fast, and it has uh, low memory use, which is the, those are the main two features. And uh, it's becoming quite widely used for, for scientific and technical analysis. And also in uh, web services. I think on uh, Node, it's the most widely used image resizing library now. Uh, and it's actually some, some, for these things. It's small and simple. It's only it's 15,000 lines of C for the for the core. Go another uh, 100 or so for the kind of uh, the the the, op the opera. Oh, this thing's useless. For the for the for the operations uh, on, on top of it. So to um, to explain very quickly uh, how VIPS works and and how it has these uh, low memory use and, and so on, uh, we have to go back in time um, a, a long way uh, before the dinosaurs. Uh, all the way back to 1990. And uh, this is the uh, Vasari scanner at the National Gallery here, here in London, which uh, I help work on. And uh, this is a, a thing for scanning old master paintings to look for evidence of long-term color change. And it's a little hard to make out, uh, but there's a, a high-resolution monochrome camera here. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the painting on an easel at the back. This whole thing is a stage. It moves over about a two meter square. Uh, there's a, a tungsten halogen projector here, uh, a filter box here with seven broadband interference filters, and then a fiber optic guide to carry the colored light in front of the camera. So uh, this thing would scan, in, it kind of saw a postcard size piece of the painting at once. So it would drive to each part of the painting, take seven monochrome photos with the seven filters, and then assemble them all to make a single, a high-resolution uh, spectral image of the, of the painting. Uh, now, back in 1990, uh, computers were not as they are now. And we had uh, we spent uh, 40,000 pounds on a Sun 4 330. Uh, it was a very, very nice computer. It had uh, 32 megabytes of RAM, and it had an extraordinary. Is it just not working? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh. Is that? Okay, better. Uh, yeah, 32 megabytes of RAM and an amazing 25 megahertz processor. So uh, that made assembling these large data sets uh, a gigabyte, at least for an image, uh, very challenging. Um, and it forces you into a structure rather like this for the, for the software. Uh, you have uh, a, source, a source data on disk. You stream it through memory, um, through a set of processing operations, and you write to a... Uh, that's a disk again at the end. And to, to get reasonable performance, you have to uh, uh, only scan once and uh, do as much as you can on the data as it passes through the system. And this isn't. I don't think this is working either. This is working just because you're moving. So you don't have to hold this. So you can All right, thank you. Um, and this is still more or less the structure VIPS has today. Uh, has a, a couple of interesting features from a technical point of view. So uh, um, it does horizontal threading. So each core on your computer gets a whole copy of the image pipeline. Um, and this uh, reduces the amount of locking you need. So uh, VIPS is able to run without any, almost without locks. There's a single mutex on the input, a single one on the output, but all the rest of the system is lockless. Uh, so it scales very well with large numbers of cores. Uh, it's tileless, 
most image processing systems have um, divide images into a, a grid of regular grid of tiles. Uh, VIPS doesn't have that. Instead, it has a, a sets of uh, overlapping regions plus a set of rules to try to keep recomputation down. And again, this removes locking. And it does various things like uh, runtime code generation as well. So you give it a job to do, and it'll write you a small program at runtime which implements exactly that operation on your, on your data set. So here are some benchmarks. Uh, this is at the top, obviously, because <laughs> uh, I wrote the benchmark. Um, so, here's, uh, typical, so here's the key, the takeaway thing, which is the graphics magic and image magic, which I'm sure most people will be familiar with. VIPS is typically uh, four, four times faster and needs one-tenth of the memory. Uh, so finally, getting into the applications. So I worked on uh, technical imaging in museums for a long time, and uh, this is often based around different imaging modalities. So you'll, be, uh, you'll have uh, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, x-ray, all these, these different things. Uh, every museum will have a different setup for imaging. And uh, this makes comparing images between institutions very difficult because differences in the images don't necessarily reflect differences in the objects. So this is a, a, a little program, or I should say this is, a, this is one of the NIP, whoops, sorry, this is one of the VIPS GUIs. Um, and it's kind of an image processing spreadsheet. And it's halfway between Excel and Photoshop, if you can imagine that kind of horrible combination. Uh, <laughs> So this thing, you stick in um, visible, uh, infrared, ultraviolet. This is ultraviolet-induced visible fluorescence. And this is visible-induced visible induced infrared fluorescence. There you go. <laughs> so you stick in all these images. And there are uh, calibration targets in there, too. So you, obviously you can't see it. But there's a Macbeth here, and there's a set of spectral arms, which are uh, reflectance standards, which have uh, pretty much a flat reflectance value all the way from ultraviolet to uh, far infrared. Um, put them into this thing. You just drag them in. Uh, each of these images is large. And then there's a set of tabs across the top. The first one, you mark a few control points to show how the images line up. And then the whole thing calculates, it all ripples through and you have this as the final slide. And it's uh, calibrated all of the images using the Macbeth plus the reflection standards, uh, generates a lot of metrics for how good the calibration is. Um, it does false color, uh, infrared, and visibles. And here, this is the quite an interesting bit. It does Kibalka Monk. Um, does anyone know what Kibalka Monk is? This is uh, one of the models for paint mixing. So um, this is, oh, hang on. this is, uh, hang on, UV-induced visible fluorescence, uh, this one here. Now, as the uh, light is produced in the paint nodes from the fluorescence, obviously the light is going to light up the paint as well. You don't just see the light. It picks up color from the paint medium it's being emitted from. So what you can do is use Kabelka Monk, which is this paint mixing model, to take the contribution of the visible reflectance out of your emission image. So you just see the light that's been emitted from the surface. And uh, this example actually isn't, the difference isn't dramatic. Uh, but honestly, it does help a bit. You, you see, uh, this, this is the one with the, um, most of the visible color removed. It's a chalk drawing by Perugino, by the way, if you're curious. Uh, so here's another example. Um, this is uh, medical imaging. So I work at, uh, Oh, I'll have to speed up even more. Uh, I, I work at uh, Imperial College doing medical research, and this is a NIT2 workspace. Oh, I, I meant to, hang on, one, sorry, one thing about this. I meant to finish with a, something about VIPS. So this is a, a big workspace. This enormous thing is uh, a huge graph of image processing operations joined up. It's around 10,000 operations joined together, uh, and it takes about 20 seconds to load the workspace, and after that, at that point, it's got 400, over 400 gigabytes of images uh, because of these, these, these images are being processed repeatedly. Um, but because these aren't real images, it's all data flow, on-demand, uh, lazy stuff. It actually runs in only 500 megabytes of RAM on this quite modest laptop. And if you change 
like a spreadsheet. If you change something on one of the early tabs, all the calculations just ripple through, and it takes maybe 10 seconds to do uh, recalculate the whole thing after that. So um, because VIPS has this low memory use, it enables this type of uh, application, which wouldn't really be possible with a, a more conventional imaging library. Then here's the same thing. This is an even more complicated workspace. I'll skip through it very quickly. This is doing uh, modeling of tracer uptake in uh, cancer patients and uh, looking for evidence of pulmonary disease. Um, and again, this, is, this, is a, this one has 15,000 nodes. It's a much more complicated workspace. But it, it, VIPS does work at these large scales. Uh, virtual microscopy, uh, this has become very popular now in the university sector. So instead of having a, a microscope slides, which you hand around your department, uh, which get broken because people tread on them. Uh, instead, you uh, put the slide into one of these scanners uh, once, and then everyone can view the slide on their desktop. And these images are enormous. They're um, typically 200,000 by 200,000 pixels. They're absolutely huge. Uh, so they're, they're very difficult to work with. But VIPS is popular in, in this field. It's, it's used for most of the large slide pathology libraries now uh, for stuff like that. Um, Image resizing, um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of websites now do image resizing on the fly, so they don't shrink images beforehand when, on upload. Instead, they, they, they size images in real time as people view, as people view things, and, and Vips is popular for this. Uh, I think Tumblr and Wikipedia and lots of sites are using it internally now for that, that kind of thing. Uh, then this is this is really this is a really fun thing. Uh, this is RTI imaging, which is uh, does anyone come across this? You have a single camera, a single fixed camera, a single fixed object, but you get 3D, and it works by moving the light source. So this dome has uh, 80 LEDs inside, which you fire in sequence. You take 80 photos, and then from those 80 photos, you can reconstruct uh, a 3D image of the object, and. Uh, you end up with quite a large data set because the camera is um, an expensive 50 megapixel camera times 80 photos. It's a, it's a large amount of data to work with. So uh, the, the, the main fitter for making these things is, is based on VIPs. And then uh, here's a viewer as well. So um, she's upside down. I, I don't, know, don't know why. But um, this is quite a nice thing for a website. So this is a uh, RTI image. So it, sitting on a website, it's all written WebGL. And uh, you can pick up a, a light bulb here and move it around over the surf surface. It, it all relights. And it works, it works really nicely. It's at quite a good speed. And uh, these images can be very large, and you can share them over the web. And again, this is uh, VIPs for the back end for making the, uh, making the images. Uh, I, and I can demo that if anyone's curious. It's a nice technique that you ultimately more widely used. People, uh, archaeologists love it because um, it enables them to republish all their work again. Uh, these, uh, like a, you have a little Babylonian clay tablet. You know the kind of thing with uh, um, uh, what's the writing called? Cuneiform. Thank you very much. Yeah, cuneiform script on. And these, the script was made by scribes with little wooden sticks, and the end of each wooden stick has a very distinctive pattern because these sticks lasted six months. You see, you see the wood grain. But with RTI, you can see into the pattern of the end of the marks that the stick made. And you can match them up across tablets. So you can say that these two tablets were made within six months of each other by the same scribe. And uh, archaeologists have been using this to construct very elaborate networks of, uh, uh, and timelines of all of these Babylonian cuneiform tablets. And it's, it's using uh, RTI for that. Uh, and it's uh, very popular with um, Egyptologists as well, because you can actually do it in the field. I talked about a dome and lights. One minute, yes, I, I'm, I'm coming to a climax. <laughs> it's not obvious, I know. <laughs> um, uh, it's really fun, because you, you put a, um, uh, a snooker ball next to your uh, stone tablet out in the desert somewhere, put the camera on a tripod, and then go bang, 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 maybe 10 shots with a flash. And then from the position of the bright spot on the snooker ball, plus the brightness. You can get the distance and the angle of the light source, and then you can reconstruct 3D from that. So you can make 3D models out in uh, the Egyptian deserts of scratches on uh, stone surfaces, and then later use RTI to pull 3D out of that and get a really nice 
model of the surface, and you can exaggerate the surface normals so to make uh, these scratches much more readable as well. So that's, uh, that's quite fun too. I want to have a page of collaborators to finish. We showed the people whose work I've talked about. Okay, thank you very much.